that doesn't want to play. Oh, there we go. I'll lower the quality a little bit. German internet is really not that great, or at least not in Hamburg. This is the best that this area can do. Um, I don't know if that wants to play. All right, let's play the other one. There were two videos. Quality is terrible. All right, let's see if we can get better, better video footage. All right, for whatever reason, the video is not playing great. Um, if it's not, then, huh? Then I'm just going to switch to the next next one and we're gonna come back to Dan. Uh, we're gonna come back to Dan later or next weekend. All right, there we go, now, now we got stuff going. All right, so here's a wave, so this is in Mexico. Nice, so looks like a fun spot to sail. Nice waves. Let's watch this again. Okay, so my, my main comment on this is about wave selection, because I think, I think that was nicely written. Um, I don't know why this this doesn't this video doesn't seem to be working. So we'll come back to that one. Uh, but what I what I want to talk about with that wave is it was well written. Uh, the conditions looked light, looked kind of difficult to get speed on the wave, but there were nice waves. And in those conditions, in any condition really, wave selection and placement and timing on the wave are what are gonna make or break your session uh, because you don't have the wind to cheat. So the wind's not providing you with a lot of extra speed, the wind's not um, helping you get to the right place, it's not giving you the speed when, when you come up to the top of the wave and there's nothing there. Um, so being on the right waves, on the right place on the wave, and the right time on the wave is really, really crucial. Um, this is something that I feel like I can just like print on a t-shirt and just say all the time. It's like the quickest way to improve your wave riding is to be on better waves. And I don't mean go travel, I don't mean go to Cabo Verde. I mean just the day that you're sailing, make sure that you're picking the best waves. And I know it's so much fun, right? Riding waves and you just wanna like go in on anything. And I know that feeling. We all know that feeling, but if you're patient, it will pay off um, and it will lead to one, the biggest improvement in your ability. So you can improve huge, like in a day, like in five minutes you can improve um, if you just catch a better wave. Like something that's pretty interesting, um, you know, if you sit watching at like Hokipa or somewhere and you'll see someone like Levi, who's a, you know, a, a legend of the sport, and if, if from the, you filmed all his waves from that day and you took the waves that were not very good, like the, like the actual wave itself wasn't very good, you could spend a lot of time analyzing what he's doing wrong, what he should be doing different, oh, he needs to like lean forward more, needs to move his hands, all, you know, all these technical things. But then you just look at the best waves from that day and all those problems will be gone. You know, the better the wave is that you're on, the better you'll ride it. The more speed you'll have, uh, the more dynamic everything will be, the more everything just works. You don't have to force anything. Um, it's just like magic, really. And, and this, is, this is so, so huge. And it's, it's the biggest thing that anyone can do 
to improve their wave riding and instantly, instantly. You just have to be on the better wave. So if we go back, we go back to this wave from Dan, you know, he's doing a good job riding the wave, but the wave behind, the wave behind seems to offer really a lot more potential. Let's make this a bit bigger so it's easier to see. So see, he's, he's, he's getting in his turns to pump there to stay on the wave. But look at the wave behind. Look at that thing peeling. It's got a lot of power. He could ride that thing down here, still ride it, and then maybe kick out there. Um, and so if you want to like condense this down to a single, a single rule, so like the, the general rule is wave selection. It's just all about wave selection. If you, if you get really into watching uh, contests, either surfing contests or windsurfing, this is true, really true in surfing as well, it comes down to who picks the better waves. Like, I don't know, I want to say like 80% of the time, it's just heats are won on wave selection. Because the level, like the guys are all pretty good. Um, and so it comes down to wave selection. And then you have you know, if someone is, is consistently getting better waves, but they don't have the ability, they'll still win. Um, and so it's, uh, wave selection is so important. So that's the general rule that you should always be working on. But the, the like single takeaway from this clip from Dan is always look behind you. So you can catch a wave, look over your shoulder, see where the wave looks behind. Is it better? Is there someone on it? If it's a better, bigger, longer, cleaner wave, um, and there's someone on it, then, you know, tough luck. You're gonna have to ride your wave, or maybe you pull off your wave and you go for the wave behind the one that's behind you. And this can be a bit of a gamble. You know, I do this a lot at Hokipa where maybe I'll jive off one wave and I'll sail out quickly out the back because I'm trying to keep priority and there's someone on the wave directly behind me and I wanna see what the waves look like behind them. And sometimes, sometimes they're worse. Um, and, and it's something that then you, you kind of get a gut, gut feeling for, and you know, you're not always gonna be right, but sometimes you will be. Um, and, and the main thing though, is that you wanna always look behind you. And if, if the wave directly behind you is better and there's no one on it, get on it. Um, and so I do that constantly actually when I'm coming in. It's not just a one-time thing. So when I, as soon as I get on the wave, I look at the one behind. Is it better? If it's better, I change right away. If I'm not sure, I keep coming in. And then as the wave starts to kind of form up and, and you get more information about the waves, I look again. Is it better? Is there anyone on it? If there's no one on it and it's better, I'm gonna get on it. And so it's a really good habit that you wanna be in of just always turning around, looking at that one behind before you set up is it a better wave? Should you switch? And, you know, if there's someone on it and there's people on all the other waves behind you, whatever. But it's still worth looking, even if you know that there's someone behind, because it is training your brain and your brain is getting better at evaluating the waves. And so, so much of this stuff, like people are like, oh, how do you train a wave selection, right? You know, it's such like a, I don't know, hard to define skill, you're either on the good waves or you're not, is it luck, what is it? And uh, for me, like the biggest thing, the biggest way to train it is just awareness. Uh, if you start being aware of waves and you're paying attention to the quality of the waves you're on, the quality of the waves around you, what they look like out to sea, what they look like when they break, you're gonna get better at it. Your brain will, will figure it out. So doing this where you look back and check out the wave behind you, not only are you gonna sometimes score a better wave behind you, like in the case with Dan, but you're also gonna get your brain working so that you're more aware and you're better able to select the waves um, on your first try, you know, on your first jibe. Um, so this, that, this is a pretty big, important point, And it, it's something that I'm gonna say a lot uh, because it's so important. Um, all right, we've got a comment from Carl. Couldn't agree more. I'm not the best surfer, but I learned with surfing that wave selection is super important. I think learning to surf really helps with wave selection. I totally agree. And surfing's a pretty good analogy. Like, 
I, I used to surf a lot when I was growing up and now I don't surf that much um, throughout the year, you know, a handful of times. And it's funny because I spend so much time riding waves. And so I have these like really like kind of hit or miss wave rides. Like I have some waves where, you know, I'm getting tons of turns, I've got lots of speed, I'm hitting the lip, I'm whatever. And those are the waves where I'm on the right wave and in the right place. And then there's other waves where whatever, I paddle in a little bit wrong or I'm not totally in the right place and it just doesn't work, right? I, I just don't have those surfing muscles to then adjust to that. Um, but the, the point is, is that you get better just by being on the right waves and in the right place. And so one, one way to, to do that or to help do that is to always look behind, look at the wave behind you and see if there's no one on it, if you should drop back. All right, so great first topic. I, I like that. I think it's an important, um, important topic, you know, wave selection, placement, timing. If you just work on those three things, it's enough. You don't have to work on anything else. You, you'll keep improving on the water. All right, so we've got a question. What's next on our, on our list? guys are asking so many questions in the group. It's amazing. All right, we've got a question from Mark about short board tax. So tax are pretty important if you're gonna be wave riding a lot because they help you stay upwind. Uh, and so they're a very useful tool uh, in the wave sailors tool belt. So I, I think I think learning good shortboard tacks are pretty important. This is something where I'm gonna talk about it right now. I'm gonna say my what I think is useful. Uh, but I think I need to also just make a video on this. Um, and when when that will happen, I have some footage that I already filmed. Maybe I have enough to do it. I might need to film some more which is then just a function of when I can go sailing and when I can get filmed. Um, all right, but let's, let's dive into it. So you guys know that's kind of on the docket. When I've got the, I've got the time and the footage, I'll, I'll try and put together some YouTube content for, for tax, because I think it's pretty important for wave sailors, uh, especially for, for spots with current and onshore winds, tricky conditions where you want to stay upwind, where it's important to stay upwind. Um, all right, so I've got a video of a tack and I'm going to pull that up and then I'm going to show you a few things that I do. I, I'm trying to think of what the most, um, what the most useful, useful things to say. So I'm going to go over some, so a lot of these things in the uh, whatever I make, whatever whatever the YouTube thing is that comes out of this. Um, because that, that's a little bit of a different format rather than the live format, which makes it, I think, a bit easier to go in depth. Um, but let's, um, where did I put this video? I found this video for this topic. Where did I put it? Um, yeah, so the thing with, the thing with tax while I try and get this video set up is you, I think you can break it down into two sections. You've got the, the footwork and then the, the hands, the sail. And so you can focus on, I think like one or the other at, at a time. I think focusing on both might be too much. Um, and then, you know, it's something that, because tax are so important, it can be worth, you know, spending a day, if the waves aren't great, just working on the tax. Um, and it can be useful to, to take out a bigger board and, um, all right, I think I've got these tax now. You could take out a bigger board and, uh, 
yeah, give it give it a go, just just tacking the whole day. Um, all right, let's find this tacking footage. All right, here we go. So these clips don't show it perfectly. Um, there are tacks. Hold on, hold on a second. Let's, uh, I've got another video. Paul uh, shot all these great videos of me in Maui in the spring. And what I like about the drone footage is that you really get a good uh, overhead view of the tax. So here, I'm gonna flip the camera around. Yeah, uh, March and yeah, sometimes one side's gonna be easier than the other, but if you practice them enough, then uh, they should be the same. All right, so here's a video from me on the outside at Hokipa. So you can go boom to boom, or grab the boom with the new front hand. But what, what I like to do is grab the, so if you can see, I grab the, uh, grab the mast with my old front hand and I grab it quite early. So look, I've already grabbed the mast here, which you can do tacks however you want. I think if you're just learning the tacks, that this is how I recommend learning it. I think this is the easiest, quickest way to tack with the mast, or uh, with the hand on the mast below the boom. And so then you get the carve upwind, Come around, sheet in. All right, so now I'm gonna break that down a little bit. I'm gonna focus on, so today I'm gonna focus on, I'll focus on both, both the feet and the hands. And so I'm gonna say something about the feet and then I'm gonna uh, say something about the hands. And the hands, I can show you um, some exercises you can do on the beach. So for the feet, one thing I just want to point out, and again, I'm going to do some YouTube content that will go into this in more depth because I think that's a better medium for it. But what I want to show you here, I've got one foot between the straps and I've got one foot in front of the mast. So just watch the feet, the carve up wind. Now, what I do here is the feet switch. So I never come onto the nose of the board. So my feet are touching, they're hugging the mass base. They're never coming onto the nose of the board. So I'm never sinking the nose of the board. And so that my front foot is here. I shuffle up the mast, just switch the feet, and the other foot lands back between the straps. So I'm never going on the nose because on a weight board that'll sink it and and make it make it more difficult. Um, and I'm also not rushing to get back on the board, right? This is where the board floats the most. So you have the best balance here, All right? So I do this shuffle. It's, it's a very simple motion, starting with the foot in front of the mast as I'm carving up wind, one foot between the straps. And I just bring that back foot to the front foot as I kind of twist my body around. And so that's... That's what I recommend with the feet. 
Um, and so you're never going onto the nose of the board. And it's a, it's a pretty simple motion of just one foot goes in front of the mast, like exactly in front of the mast. And then you just trade places and you shuffle and shift, shift back. And then about the sail, So you're falling into windward after rounding the mast quite often. Momentum taking me into windward. Yeah, so Carl makes a good point. The faster you're going, the easier it is because the more stability you have. Um, if you're falling to windward, I think that the next tip I have is gonna be the most useful for you, um, which is what I like to call opening and closing the door. So I'm gonna show you, so for everyone that's just joining us, we're talking about fast tacks, wave tacks, tacks on a short board. Uh, we just went over the footwork, now we're talking about some of the sail dynamics. Um, for the live coaching format, uh, this is, not a, a total com comprehensive overview of the tax, and I'm planning to make some YouTube content for that. Um, and so, Mark, what, what I think will help you the most from how you describe falling, again, if you have photos or video, that'll be the most useful uh, thing for me to give, give Katrik. But what I think will help you the most is what I'm about to say with sail handling. So what I like, the way I like to think about it is you're opening and closing a sliding door. So I put the sail back. See, I'm putting the sail back, like the boom is going towards the tail of the board. Boom goes towards the tail of the board. And you can really exaggerate this. So when you're carving up into the wind, you can really, even more than I'm doing here, really get this sail back. And that's doing two things. One, it's carving you up into the wind, as you can see here. And two, is it makes this space that your body can go through. So you're making this little opening so you don't have to lean too far over onto the nose and you can stay centered and upright, which allows you the best balance. And then when you come onto the new side, so see, the sail is back, this door is open. Close, close that sliding glass door. And so, look at this hand. It's across my body. That's how far back the sail is, right? And then I bring it, bring it around, closing that door. And that's doing a few things. So when you bring the sail then across your body like that, it's putting the sail in the position that's gonna drive the board more downwind again, which helps complete your turn. And it also helps backwind the sail which then gives you stability because then there's pressure in the sail. It's coming from the other side, but it's something that you can lean against to help you stabilize. So there's just a split second there where I stabilize on top of the sail. So I push out against it and then sheet in and go. So we, we watch this in real speed. Um, so let me flip this around. I'm going to show you, show you what I'm talking about on land. Let me see um, if I have if there's another video. I'll try and find one. I'll try and find another one. If I do the YouTube thing, which is not if, I will do it. Um, I'll try and find a better tack.
tack to show because you can see it from some, from some other angles. But what I want to show about opening and closing the door. So the wind is coming from, the wind is coming from that way. Okay. Sailing in, I grab the mast, put the foot in front of the mast, carve back. So I'm going on my heels and I'm pulling the sail back. So I'm opening that door, okay? When I'm about to go around the door, I give a little sheet in, which I think is important. So the sheet in helps carry your speed. So you, you get a little extra burst of speed before you let go of the sail. Also that pushes you a little bit more upwind. And it also kind of makes the sail more stable because then it's got a bit of wind in it, which will last for a split second, which will help stabilize the whole rig. So you give a little sheet in, you do that shuffle with your feet, and then when you get to that new side, with this arm, bring it forward. Grab again. Does that make sense? You're closing the door. So if you're doing it boom to boom, you come in, shuffle, see, so this arm is across the body, You've the door's open, close the door, bring that forward. Um, so again, I'll, I'll go into more detail about this um, in something for YouTube. I've, I've got to collect the footage. Maybe I, maybe I have enough that I don't need to film anything new, but I probably do, um, but, but we'll see. And uh, I'll try and put some stuff on YouTube, but what I think will help most Mark is, is doing that, really exaggerating that, opening the door and then closing the door when you get to the new side. And uh, that, and then making sure that you're not too much on the nose of your board. Um, both of those can cause the problem that you described. All right, so Sammy's got a question. Um, look forward and not at your feet. Once you change to the other side, helps with the balance on the, on the board. Yeah, that also, Makes a lot of sense. Oh, that's a good. That's a good tip from Sam. You always want to. You almost never want to be looking at your hands or feet. You always want to be looking where you're going to be going. All right. So next, um, I've got a question from Sammy about how wave sails work. All right. Let me get to that original question. Uh, okay, so the question is, for sail quiver, would it be possible to give us a general explanation of how wave sails work why one brand or model is more powerful than the others, how the sail works in general, how it impacts the board performance. All right, so we went over this a little bit actually last week. And so there's a few different aspects to, to sails and how they're, how they're designed. Um, the flatter a sail is, the stiffer it'll feel. Uh, the more shape it has, the more full it is, then the, the softer it will feel. Um, for wave sails, you're really trying to balance a lot of different things. You want something that's early planing. You want something that is lightweight. You want something that is maneuverable. You want something that is durable. Um, and so designing a wave sail is, is about balancing all these things. And then in, in the testing, um, you know, we're, we're trying things out into testing. Testing sails is is a kind of interesting process. Um, so the way that, that I do it, or we do it at Ezzy, I don't know if other brands are, are the same, is so if you have, for example, a new 5.0, so what do you do? So you test it against the production 5.0, and then maybe you had a prototype as well between the two. So go out, 
preferably with another person. It's, it's good to do it with two people. Um, and you each have one mass. So you always are, so you try the sail for say 10 minutes, come in, derig it, rig again, because you want to stay on the same mass because there might be some small difference with a different mass that can be affecting the performance of the sail. And then it's a back and forth process. So it's not enough to go out if you've just got two sails to try on one and then the other. You go on one, then the other, then on the first one, then on the second one, and the first, and then, so you're going back and forth like this, maybe every every 10 minutes. And rigging the sails differently, playing with the rigging, you know, you start with them rig the exact same to each other, and then start start experimenting with it, playing with it, seeing uh, if, if, if one of the sails needs to be rigged a bit differently from the other one. And then, uh, tr yeah, just trying to look at the, the feelings what, what it feels like with the sail, you know, is one more powerful, less powerful. And it's, it's pretty interesting to look at video footage. Um, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the feeling as well. I, I found it pretty interesting. Sometimes there'd be a sail that didn't feel as good, but in the video, I was sailing way better on it. So it's I like in the group we've had a lot of questions between the Taka and the Zeta and I used to use the Takas a lot maybe three or four years ago and then at Hokipa the last few years before the Ezi Wave was developed which is now all I ride um, but before that then I was on sometimes the Elite sometimes the Zetas and it was interesting because a lot of the times I felt like the Taka felt better at Hokipa but when I looked at the footage I was performing better on the Elite or the Zeta. Um, which is which is kind of strange, interesting mentally um, to think about. Um, but so anyway, so when you when you're designing a sail, you know, you're looking at all these different different things and taking notes, and then trying trying the sails in different conditions, and then um, you know I'm not doing any actual sail design um, and working mainly with my dad. Uh, but then I'll, I'll give him my my notes, and we'll have a discussion about about. You know, he might have some, some follow-up questions and then there's a lot of trial and error. So, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the smallest change makes a big difference in how a sail feels. Um, and so sometimes you make a change and it doesn't feel better. Um, maybe it feels worse, but you make a change in that same direction a little bit more and it will feel good. Um, and sometimes you don't know why that is as well. You can try to explain it after the fact. Um, and you know, sometimes you go into making changes with a lot of theory behind it. Uh, and sometimes they don't work and sometimes they do work and it works exactly as it was predicted to. Um, and I think the most, one of the most important things is not being too stuck on the theory. Um, so if you have a theory about what will happen, that's great. But at the end of the day, what matters is how it feels, not what the theory is. And you know, the aerodynamics of windsurfing are actually really, really complicated uh, for wave sailing. You know, we're not just going in a straight line. Um, and so there's a lot of different factors, factors there. So, um, yeah, it's nice to have a theory. It's a good starting point. But at the end of the day, it's, it's about the testing. Um, and if you get stuck in, in theory crafting, then uh, it's, it's a mistake because what matters is how the sail fe feels, not not the theory behind it. All right, so this is this is a huge topic, and and we can talk more about it um, as well later. Um, if if there are more specific questions about sails and sail design, um, let me know. I'm planning to go back to Maui, and maybe I can get some video of my dad as well. Um, you know, he's been doing this now for. I don't know, 40 years or something, designing sales, maybe more. Um, so he's, this is his life. And uh, yeah, so I, he would be happy to talk about this stuff. Um, so I'll try and do that when I go back to Maui. And if you guys have more specific questions, um, ask them in the group. And then I can either answer them or I can, I can uh, ask my dad. All right. Um, 
we've got the next one, the next topic is backside writing. It was Brian that asked the question, is there a photo or video to go with it? Um, Brian, I don't see a photo or video, so I'm gonna assume there isn't one. Uh, we're gonna get, so I'm gonna try to, I mean a lump, so we're talking about backside riding and Hill also asked about backside riding and he sent a video. So we're gonna start with, start with his backside. He also asked about takas, uh, but we're just gonna look at the backside first and then, and then we'll get into the takas later. Um, yeah, no worries, Brian. We don't need a video. I was just double checking, making sure I didn't miss anything. All right, so here's a video from Hill. So this is a video of a video. All right, so there's the backside. So I think that backside riding is very important and very underappreciated. All right, so there, there's, there's the, the action moment. So I think that backside riding is First of all, very cool. I think you can do a lot going backside that looks um, looks really cool. Um, and then second of all, it's a great way just to improve your general wave writing. Because like I've said before, the, the most important things for everyone to work on are wave selection, placement, and timing. And those things don't care whether you're going front side or back side, right? It's the same. I mean, you're looking for different placement, maybe different timing, um, but but you're working on those skills, whether you're going front side or back side. And so that's like really the most important thing for everyone to be working on is wave selection, placement, and timing. And you can do that going back side, right? And then a lot of these, a lot of these waves that you have around the world with more onshore conditions, they're actually better for riding backside. And so one thing that I, you know, I, I've said a lot in this coaching and it came up also on the camp is to look upwind and downwind before you make a decision of where you're gonna ride the wave. Uh, because in a lot of places, especially when the wind is more onshore, you should be going backside rather than frontside. And then there's a whole lot of other benefits as well. Like for example, you can learn um, aerials going backside, which will really help your frontside aerials because you're, you're figuring out the timing and the board connection. Um, so those are, those are pretty, pretty useful skills, useful skills to have. Um, so here, I've got some of my own little backside clips that we can look at. Um, I think that, Brian, you've got the just kind of basic backside where you get the sail down and you're just kind of picking up a bit of speed from the wave and carrying on. You've got your backside aerial, which is kind of like a shove it. And then you've got the backside carving turn where you're getting the, the rail really engaged. And there's a lot of similarities with how, how to get into these these moves. So if we go back to the the video from, from Hill. So I'm gonna flip the camera again, camera around again. So he really throws the sail back into his shins. And that is exactly what you wanna do. So I think he could lean forward more and longer. So he's already starts coming back upright 
by the time that he meets the, the white water on the wave. And what I want to see is that he's driving in, in this nice, powerful position, with the sail back, leaning forward, until he hits the wave, and then the wave will push him around. So, Hill, that's my biggest, biggest comment here is you, um, you want to use the power of the wave to redirect you. So, again, this is a common theme that we're going to keep coming back to is that, you know, wave, wave riding, if you're doing it right, is easy. If you're working, if you're trying too hard, you're doing it wrong. And, you know, this, all this equipment has been designed to pick up the power of the wave and turn it into board speed. And so all you have to do is put it in the right positions. And you don't need to do the work of turning it. So here you're doing a bit of the work of, of turning the board. You're starting to redirect it. What I want to see is you just drive up into this wave, place the bottom of the board into the wave, and the wave, the power of the wave, is going to transfer right into that board and kick you back with board speed. So here's a... So this one is a bit more of a backside aerial. This is from me. So this is uh, the same kind of approach as what Hill's doing where I'm, you know, throwing that sail back into my shins while keeping my eye on the lip. And then see, like, look, I keep driving into it. And then I let the wave turn me. And in this, in this instance, I'm able to get some, get some air. Um, but the, the important, the important part, what, what the takeaway is, is all this setup. You know, throwing the sail back into your shins and then letting the, the swell redirect you. And so in this case, there's enough power that I get air, but it doesn't have to be. It can just, it can just push you around, um, without, without getting the fins out of the water. Then here's an example of... So putting the sail back and then, so this is, this is more of a, there's not that much actually here to push off of. So I'm coming really hard onto the toes. And so this is more like a backside cutback. And then I'm trying to drive that forward rail and then I try and turn it into a bottom turn. But that's another kind of turn that you can do where, so you do this kind of same kind of entry and then on that steep part of the wave, you just drive down it with your toes, really pushing hard on the forward, forward rail of the board. So here's another example, driving the sail into the shins, pulling it back. And you, to do that, you can really sheet in to help bring the sail up. So here you see, look, look how, I'm sh how hard I'm sheeting in here. And then to support yourself, you can sheet out again. So once the, the wave starts pushing you back, so here I'm sheeting out, the sail back winds, fills with wind, and helps, helps give me stability because it's then a, you know, like a solid thing when it's full of wind. Um, there's, I think, a few more backsides in here. So, same kind of thing. Sheet in, bring the sail into the shins. Look where you want to go, and then let the wave redirect you. So see, I just, just drive it into the wave. The wave makes contact, pulls it, pushes it around. There's another one. Again, really using the power of the wave. Sail goes into the shins. Just putting the board up into the wave, sheeting out for stability. See, I'm really sheeting out here, which pu pushes, it gets the sail back winded, which gives me a lot of stability. And then just letting the wave 
redirect me, just using the power of the wave. Um, that might, yeah, I think that's the last backside there. Um, yeah, so I think you can really lean a lot more forward than you think you can. And that comes from driving the sail into the shins and then leaning forward onto it and pushing out against it. And when you push out against it, it gets backwinded and pushes you back up. And that that's what allows that sail to go down like that. But if you wanna just work on the carving in the beginning, that's also totally valid. And to do that, you don't need to do that kind of shove it, sail down motion. Um, what I do recommend though is really getting a wide grip on the boom, like gripping to the, as far back as you can. If you're carving backside turns, makes a big, big difference. Um, so I think, I think that's a pretty good amount of stuff to try for getting into, getting into backside riding. Um, let us know in the group if you have more specific questions and, uh, yeah, we'll go from, go from there. So now we're gonna, Hill had a question about takas, and so we're gonna transition, go back to his video and look at the taka from his video. All right. All right, so here it is in slow motion. We can go through this frame by frame. So, all right, so it makes contact with the white water. over the top, get sliding. Get sliding. And then falls over. All right, so Hill, I'm gonna give you a couple things to work on. One, I want you to use the white water to get that board transitioning more. So look at how you're already turning before you get to the wave. And so then the wave isn't able to give you so much board speed. It's not able to transfer its power to you. Um, the phrase that we came up with on the, my clinic was, you wanna high five the wave. So when I get that perfect contact, that high five with the bottom of your board and the power of the wave. So in this, this example, that white water, and that allows for the most transfer of energy and power from the ocean to your board, which gives you more speed, gives you more rotation, gives you all the things you wanna have when you're doing a move like a taka. So that's that's the first, first tip. Um, I think that your hands could be a little bit wider, um, but we're just gonna stick, stick with it like this for now, I mean, you could move your backhand back, but let's focus on the other things for now. So then when you get into the sliding, right, looks good here. Now there's, there's one big mistake. Does anyone know what it is? It's a common one that keeps coming up. Doesn't matter what the move is. All right, I'm gonna tell you guys. It's the head. So he wants to rotate around this way, but he's looking this way. Now, your body, your rig, everything goes where you look. So, 
you've got the rotation started going this way, but then you're looking back this way. So in the beginning, you start looking in the rotation, and then you're looking back this way, which I've got a delay in your comments, but you guys all answered it perfectly. So thumbs up. Um, but yeah, so it's the head. So you want to look, look in the direction that you're rotating. And it's really as simple as that. Then the other stuff will fall in place. So get that high five with the board, high five with the white water with the bottom of your board and look, look where you're going. So in that same, in that same video that we just watched with, um, with, uh, those backside riding. Let me find that again. And, uh, I've got some tacos in here. Flip this around. Get this out of the way. So this is like not a great section, but see, I'm getting that, that high five and I mean, this is not a great section. This is not a great taka. But look at my head. Over the shoulder, over the shoulder. Over the shoulder, looking where I'm going. Looking where I'm going. And it's like magic. If you're doing that, everything else just falls into place. Um, there's more takas in this video. So here's another one. So looking, looking, looking over the shoulder, looking over the sh sh shoulder, looking over the shoulder. So you got to look, look where you want to go. If you're looking the opposite way, that's going to stop, stop your rotation. Um, and I'm sure you can find videos of people doing landing a taco or two where they, they look back like that when they start sliding. But in general, it is a lot harder. Um, this is, this is an example of a taco that's very forced. So my hands are actually pretty close together and I just jam on the tail to get it sliding. Widen my grip at the same time. So you can see goes from narrow and then I, I grab wide. And this is a really forced talk. It's, it's not very elegant. It's not really using the wave at all. Um, and then just really looking again with the head to come around. Um, here, I'll, I can play that in real speed. Um, Yeah, that's not a taka. So that's, um, those are my two tips, Hill. Uh, you got to get that high five with the wave. So try and get as much energy from the wave as possible using the wave to help you turn, help give you speed. And then look where you want to go, you know? So you, it seems like you're getting the initiation good. You're getting that slide, you're getting that rotation, but you just got to look with the head. And then everything else will, will come, will come, you know, your body, your body knows what to do, um, but you just gotta, just gotta look, look in the right way. Um, all right, so next, we've got a question from Martin. Um, <clears throat> question from Martin about Tax. Turning the head, what about the nose? Tristan, what's the question? What about the nose, the nose of the board? Just tell me a little bit more what you mean. 
and then I'll, I'll give you an answer. Um, all right, so Martin, I gotta find your question, Martin. great questions in here. I'm, I'm still not sure I understand your question, Tristan. Um, so I think you want to be looking, looking over your, your shoulder in the direction that you're, you want to be spinning. Um, so you're asking whether you should be looking at your nose. Okay, yeah, post it in the questions for this week. Um, all right, so Martin's question is, don't have any footage, but I keep struggling with my tax. Every time I try to set up, bend my front foot around the mass and jump around, but mostly end up falling in front of the board. I think it's a problem about too much weight outside of the movement. Um, okay, so I think we covered this um, we covered this in our discussion about tax. So uh, go back, look at what we talked about. You want to not get on the nose of the board, which sounds like is happening. You want to open and close the sail. It's kind of like a sliding door. And I think that'll help. All right, next question is from Ramon about membrane sales. Does Ezzy sales have any plans to do this kind of sales? Um, at the moment, there are no plans to do Ezzy sales, membrane sales. We've looked into membrane sales and um, yeah, it's super interesting. And there's, there, you know, we, we now we have a, you know, if, if it was something we were going to do, it was, have it worked out how we would do it. Um, but at the moment, it's not something we're, we're interested in. I think membrane sales are really interesting, but they're, they're very niche in windsurfing. So for, um, everyone that doesn't know what a membrane sail is. Um, it's, so it's the panel. So normally you have um, panels of cloth that are, you know, like a film laminated with um, fibers inside in a certain like directions of like a scrim or an X pattern uh, to give it strength and, and different uh, stretch characteristics. And then you sew those together and by sewing them together um, so that there's like a curve sewed to a straight line, it puts shape in the sail. And that's how you're making shape in the sail. Uh, with, a, with a membrane sail, like the big yacht sails, they're laminating the sail itself. So then they're lying down the yarns, the fibers, to fit the load of that sail. Um, and so it's, you're matching the, the load and, and the, sh the shape for that, that sail. So it's like built on a, on a membrane and, um, like North has the, um, 3DL process and there's a few other processes for, for doing the, the membrane sails. And so there's a few windsurfing sails that are done that way. They're not the exact same because we've got battens. Um, so instead you, they do the, the panels membrane panels and the panels are sewn together. So there still is quite a bit of sewing in membrane windsurfing sails. Um, I think it's really interesting. You don't save as much weight as you do with a bigger sail. So like with a really big sail, you save a ton of weight this way. Um, you know, like a big yacht sail with, with the sails that we're, we're using, like five O's or whatever, the weight gains are not, not as much. Um, and then, yeah, there's, there's some, control over how the sail is, uh, you know, the, the loading of the sail, which is, which is definitely really interesting. Um, but then the sails are also a lot less durable, so they'll, they'll fall apart um, a lot sooner than a normal sail. And then the cost is a lot higher. So I think like Severa and North, they've got membrane sails on the market and they're about, I think it's about thousand, thousand euros for a sail. Um, which again is super interesting um, and it's an, a niche space to be in, but most 
most windsurfers, wave sailors, don't seem to be wanting that. They want something that's that's a bit more durable, a bit more long lasting, and uh, that that price point seems a bit bit high. So, um, you know, we're we're trying to design sails that are useful to most most people, and that we want to use ourselves. And you know, we're trying to make really high performance sails um, with a traditional traditional sewn panel panel method but uh, you know we're, the membrane cells are super interesting and I think um, I think it's good for the sport to have that have that in the sport uh, so the question is they're cool but pretty niche and we're not going to be making them um, in the next year or two all right next question all right, so we've got a video from Frank about back loops. So we've got a lot of great questions. So we've got, so we've already been going for about an hour, so I'm gonna stop this pretty soon, but um, we've got still to go. So a question from Frank about back loops. Uh, Mikkel about bottom turns. Tristan asked about takas. And then there's a video from, or photos from Mark, um, from back loops and aerials. Um, so I'm gonna go over the back loops and then I think the rest of this, I'm going to push to next weekend. Um, let's see, how are we doing for time? We've been going for, I can't really see, but I think it's over an hour already. Um, all right, here are the videos, back loops, I'm going to flip this around. Mark also has a video with back loops. Um, all right, Mark, we'll, we'll do them next week. Um, all right, oops, why did that not? So, all right, so here's the first video. So the, the, first, the first thing that I see is not getting enough height. So the rotation is very fast, very rushed. And it's just hard if you don't go that high uh, to fit everything in. You want to really think about sailing up into the air, turning at the apex, and coming around. Um, so I think, I think this one needs more height. Now let's play the second video. All right, there's the height. So now this one has has the height. So this is this is a this is a great takeoff. So I'd like to see carves upwind on the takeoff. Great. Goes straight up into the air. Great. Comes down, lands on the board, but then loses everything. And there's a very clear reason why. So let's get a little bit closer. Look at the head. So the head is looking here, when it should be looking here, where you're gonna land. So it's so important with the back loop that at the top of the jump, you look over your shoulder, so there's a little bit of looking here, but I wanna see more. And then you really spot the landing of where you're gonna jump. 
And so by having your head looking forward like this, first of all, you don't know where you're going to land, so you're just rotating. Second of all, bringing your body weight more forward over the gear, so then when you land, you land too flat. And that's why it explodes and you fall forward. Whereas if you've been looking back over your shoulder, then your weight is not as over everything. So here's an example from Pozo, looking over the shoulder, really looking, 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 looking at the, the landing. Here's another example. See the head? From here, I spot where I'm gonna land, and I just look at that one point the whole time. And by having my head over there, let's make this a bit bigger. By having my head over my shoulder like that, here, it brings my weight out from the board, whereas if the head is looking forward, then the, the body is going to come a little bit more over the board, a little bit more upright. It's like this. My weight is a little bit outside the board, and I am able to land on the nose. And again, I'm still looking at my landing, right? As I'm coming down, I'm, I'm not looking at my hands. I'm looking at the landing. And then it just works beautifully. So there were some pictures... Um, there are some pictures I posted in the group um, of a back loop landing. Some still photos that I thought were pretty interesting to see because you can see what I'm doing with my head and how on the nose I'm landing. Um, so let me see if I can find those photos. Those photos are in the group. They're posted in the group. I'm gonna search for them. Okay, so here's here's a picture of the landing this camera around. So there's a picture of a back loop landing where my eyes are on the landing, coming in on the nose. And so it's you really want to be looking again, looking right where you're going to land. Um, and then that's what puts you puts you in the right position. Here's another photo from that same sequence. So again, looking down and you can really come in on the nose, really land on the nose. Um, all right, so got a question about the, um, question about the, the uh, feet. So let's take a look. But I like this attempt. This is really, really close. Um, if you get the head, you're going to be landing these, Frank. This is, this is, there's so many things going right here. So let's, uh, look at it again. So you go upwind, go up, come around at the top. So you got to guide with the head, guide with the head, and just focus on landing with the, with the nose. So here you're landing on your feet. Um, all right, so your question is, what about the front leg? So you don't want to try to land as flat like this, like you're doing. That looks pretty painful on your knees. You can see this, this leg is, has a lot of pressure on it. That, that's how I broke my knee, actually. Not on a back loop like this, but landing like that. Um, 
Anyway, so you want to look with your head, really, really look with your head. I think the legs are okay. So you could be more bent. So they're nice and bent here. And it looks like you straighten them as you go to land. And I think you want to keep them, keep them nice and bent. So um, here, if we go and I open this. So they don't have to be like super, super bent, but they don't straighten as I'm coming down to land, right? Like they've, they've still, the knees are still bent. Um, and that just helps make it nice and soft. Um, so you can really focus on keeping, keeping your knees up. Um, it's never a bad thing in the back loops. Um, so really it's about the head, focusing on the head, really looking where you want to land and then landing really um, on the nose. And remember, and this is something that is, I think, really hard to internalize until you start landing back loops, but if you can like get this in your head before then, it will help you land them sooner, is that you don't need to rotate very much. You only need to rotate like 180 degrees. You don't need to do a full 360. So you can land, you know, if it's onshore, which you said it is, you can land basically facing the, the beach again. You don't have to come, come around much more than that. Um, and so like really, really downwind, like so your, your angle, you know, so you go up and you come down just like that. You don't have to, you don't have to complete that rotation. Um, Cause that, the more you're trying to complete the rotation, you more you'll get those flat landings. So you really just you just go up and you just fall down the other way. Keep your legs tight and just really guide the rotation with your head. Look look with your head. Look where you're gonna land. And just keep your keep your eyes on that spot. Um, if a back loop is over rotated, you can save it. It's hard to do, so I don't know how often you'll be able to. It's hard to do. But it's possible, and the way you save it is by really sheeting in and pushing with your front arm and really angling your body, like twisting your body against the rotation. So it's almost like you're kind of doing like a front loop positioning, and then that kind of starts to rotate you back the other way a little bit. Um, and it's possible, it happens. Everyone's, all the pro guys have done that at least a few times um, but it's, it's you'd rather get it get it shot right rather than have to adjust back that way um, and and really focusing on being so far downwind getting that aiming so far downwind is I think really really a good trick and realizing you don't have to rotate that much and then using your head using your eyes you know looking where you're gonna rotate so important so, so, so important. That's the most important thing. So if you just focus on one thing, it's the head, it's the eyes. Use your head, use your eyes to guide the rotation. Go up, looking up like you did, perfect. Then the top, you look over your shoulder, you see the spot on the water where you're gonna land, and you just keep looking at that spot. That's it. Um, and then your body can help guide, guide the rig there. Um, but But that's, pretty key. That's one of the most important parts of the back loop. You know, it can happen that you land it just by luck, but if you want to land it consistently, you got to be using your, your head, your eyes to, to spot those landings. All right, guys, this has been a good, great session. And, um, kind of at all the time that I have tonight. So I know there are a few things that didn't get get mentioned, I want to quickly find that. Um, so we didn't go over, so Tristan's question about tacos and Mikkel's question about bottom turns and then Mark's post about back loops and aerials. So we'll get to that next weekend. Guys, great session, great sailing, great footage. I'm so proud of you. It takes a lot of courage to post your footage. Um, you know, like we're not, I'm not asking you guys to post your best moments, I'm asking you to post the moments you need work on, which takes a lot of courage to put that out to now a thousand strangers. So I'm proud of everyone here.
great job. Um, I'm really enjoying going through this footage. And yeah, so we'll um, see each other next week. Um, I'm planning to fly back to Hawaii. So the live coaching probably will work on Sunday, but there's a chance that it doesn't. So I'll post, I'll post an update in the group. Um, maybe if it doesn't, maybe we'll do a different day or time. But uh, anyway, guys, have a great week. Have a windy week. And keep posting your questions, photos, videos in the group. And I'll answer them in the live coaching. Um, I'll do a recap post in the group with uh, the topics that we didn't get to this week. So again, that's Mikkel, Mark, and Tristan. And uh, yeah, post your new questions and comments and I'll get to it next week. All right, have a good night, have a good week. See you next time.